Hello and welcome back to Paleocast. My name is Dave Marshall and this is episode 124 on crocodilomorph disparity with Dr. Tom Stubbs of the University of Bristol. Now, I've known Tom for quite a while with us, having shared so much time in Bristol, and I really do try to avoid institutional nepotism, but this new publication sounded like too good of a story to miss. As with most macroevolutionary analyses, the research gets very complicated very quickly, and we're talking about phylogenetics and geometric morphometrics. But in the first part of this interview, we're simply going to look at the diversity and the disparity of crocodilomorphs through time. So that's how many different species there were, and how big were the differences between them. This is the fun stuff. Like, did you know that there were herbivorous crocodiles, or even ones that were fully marine? In the second part of this interview, which will be episode 125, we'll be looking at how Tom actually did his study. This is where we'll dig deeper, looking at the methods he used, what his results tell us about rates of evolution, and what the significance of it all was. As always, we'll have pictures of what we'll be talking about on our website, and we'd love to hear from you all on social media. Which is your favourite crocodile morph? Let us know in the comments section. Anything you can do to share this episode, helping it reach new listeners, is always appreciated. And if this is your first time listening, welcome. Donations also keep the show completely ad-free, and are used either for hosting or improving quality. So a big thank you to all those who donate regularly. And as always, we hope you enjoy this episode. So, Dr. Tom Stubbs, welcome to the show. Uh, good morning, Dave. Nice to be here. Uh, how How is Bristol? Is everyone missing me? Yes, 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 definitely. We, we talk about it every day. No, I, no, I, should, <laughs> no, I shouldn't be sarcastic. No, it's, yeah, it's, it's not, we spent, you've, we were here for ages, weren't you? I've been in Bristol now for about, I've been in Bristol for 10 years, which is mad, really. Yeah. My, my entire 20s, I, I've, I've been in Bristol. Um, yeah, yeah, and it was um, great to um, have you in Bristol for that time. Are you in? You're in Manchester now, right? I am indeed. Lovely. But the audience doesn't need to know about me. We need no. to know about you. So, how did you get into the field of paleontology? So, I've all, ever since I can remember, I've had an interest in biodiversity. Really, so it goes back to watching like natural history documentaries, things like David Attenborough and those type of old BBC things, and, and I was always amazed by. The diversity of life when they showed all the colors of all the different animals then they showed the variety of life in the rainforests and in the oceans and when i was a kid that always really fascinated me i was just amazed at how diverse things can be and how weird and wonderful animals in particular are and that kind of stemmed into an interest in things from the past so obviously there's lots of amazing animals around today but once you start digging into the fossil record then you see even more amazing animals and plants so that's when I got interested a little bit more in, in, in extinct animals. And again, that, that stemmed through natural history documentaries and a little bit of Jurassic Park when I was younger. <laughs> um, so that got me interested in things like dinosaurs and marine reptiles, pterosaurs. I was always amazed as well how some groups that are still around today had, had example extinct animals from the past, which are just things that you wouldn't expect. Things like giant penguins and and um, giant flying birds, uh, which are huge condor type things, which are absolutely ginormous compared to modern flying birds. Mm. So that that all kind of culminated together in this in this interest in biodiversity and how it kind of rises and falls. So has that really been the focus of your research to date? Yeah. So I've I've worked on quite a lot of different animal groups, but the the core of my research is looking at morphology and function across evolutionary trees and across time. So I'm really interested in, in where you see large amounts of morphological innovation across the tree of life and where you see it at certain time intervals. So um, morphological innovation would be like the origin of new forms, effectively. Yeah, the origins of new forms, the or, yeah, whether that's entire elements, such as the evolution of wings in birds or, or paddle-like limbs in marine reptiles, or just 
the evolution of biodiversity in, in terms of morphology and, and functional variation. I don't study so much um, numerical diversity, so like um, just counting numbers of species. I study more morphological variation, and that's what's always interested me. Um, I've worked on lots of different groups. So my PhD was about marine reptiles. So most marine reptiles are now extinct, but they're things like ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs. Um, I have also worked on crocodiles, which is obviously what we're chatting about today. Uh, things like dinosaurs and lizards and their relatives. But um, for me, it's not so much about the animal group. It's more about the questions. It's about identifying either times in the past where there was great amount of innovation or parts of the evolutionary tree where you have great innovation as well. So can you hear that my cat's come to visit? Yeah, I could hear her and cat. Yeah. That isn't going to get on top of your answer, so don't worry about that. Oh, and, yeah, that's great. And he's going to get kicked off the table. Ready for my next question. Go on. Off you get. That was a, that was a, nice, that was a nice soothing purr, but yeah, I get he can be distracting for you. Yeah. Well, it's, maybe the audience will enjoy it. Who, who even knows? Um, so is there anything particularly important about the groups that you've studied and the time periods that they were in that required additional focus, I guess? So I, tend, I like to study groups that have quite long geological histories. So I guess you could say that about, about almost all groups in, in the fossil record. But one, one thing that I really like about crocodiles is the fact that they are so ancient. So originating um, in the Triassic, but also marine reptiles um, were around for the entire Mesozoic. There are still some marine reptiles around today, like turtles. But yeah, I tend to like groups that transcend a great amount of geological time because then you can you can track their rise and fall across major extinction intervals and see how they re they react. The kind of the ups and downs of Earth's history. Uh, so that's 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 what really interests me. That kind of really big time scale. And in terms of groups. Like I mentioned before, I, I, I'm really interested in lots of different animal groups, but most of my work has been on, on, on vertebrates, on tetrapods in particular. Uh, but I, I tend to like big, big toothy things like <laughs> marine reptiles and crocodiles and dinosaurs, but also lizard, lizards and snakes as well. So, yeah, I like, a, I like being able to study morphology by, by capturing changes to these, these anatomies and things that have nice big jaws and skulls are very interesting for looking at that type of thing. Guess who came back? Yeah, who's back? <laughs> uh, I think that he is going to be a constant presence in this. So your most recent study that was released just about a week ago now uh, focused on the crocodilomorphs and their diversity. So can we start off by ascertaining what a crocodilomorph actually is and how many of them are alive today. So yeah, the, 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 the clade crocodilomorph is quite a mouthful really, but what it generally refers to is uh, crocodile lion reptiles. So crocodilomorphs are, are, are the only surviving crocodile lion reptiles. They originated in the Triassic and um, they're, they're a group of archosaur reptiles. So in terms of living animals, uh, crocodiles are, uh, are most closely related to birds, which is mad when you think about it. But they are, both groups have a really big um, evolutionary history and a rich fossil record. So crocodilomorphs and birds can be traced back to the Triassic, to this, this large reptile clade called the archosaurs. And then down one line, you have the uh, crocodile line reptiles, and on the other line, you have the bird line reptiles. So, yeah, crocodilomorphs... Um, originated in, in the late Triassic about 230, 240 million years ago. Now, that really rich evolutionary history is hidden, really, by their biodiversity today. So there's actually only 26 species. And although the 26 species doesn't sound that bad, it, it's really, really tiny when you compare it to other equally ancient clades of kind of a, a similar taxonomic scale. So if you think about birds and the different different bird families, so there's, there's over 10,000 species of birds today. So compared to their, their sister group, their, their most close living relatives, they're, they're not doing that great in terms of species numbers. And also if you were to compare them to a, a more distant group like mammals, I think there's about 6,000 mammal species today. 
And also, if you just compare them to things like lizards and snakes, there's there's about eleven thousand lizard and snake species. So, yeah, they have this really rich history going back to the Triassic, but there's only twenty six species now. So, in this interview, I think we're we're going to have some running themes that is going to look at um, the difference between the number of individuals the number of species, and then the differences between the species. So we'll get into the the terminology for all of that. But you say that there's only 26 species of crocodile morph alive today, but how many individuals are there? So are the, the few species that are alive today, are they doing particularly well or are they threatened? So yeah, that's 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 a really interesting point. So what you have in the in the modern crocodiles or modern crocodilomorphs is a great difference in the how well different species are doing. So uh, of the twenty six living species, I think seven of them are, are critically endangered. So obviously, seven of them are not doing very well at all. Uh, that includes thing includes things like the Chinese alligator. The uh, gario, the slender snouted um, crocodile line reptile, things like the Siamese crocodile. So these are critically endangered. So they're they're really not doing very well at all. There's also a further four species which are, are vulnerable. So again, you're getting up to eleven different species there, which are quite uh, in trouble really in terms of the the diversity that they have and the number of species that they have. This contrasts quite a lot to some other crocodile species today. So if you think about things like Nile crocodiles, you'll be familiar with like natural history documentaries where you see them eating wildebeest and zebras as they try and cross the rivers in Africa. And when you look at those, there's actually quite a large number of, of Nile crocodiles. I wouldn't say there's a large number of individuals when you compare it to things like birds, but when you see a, a lakeside or a riverside, which is a sea of crocodiles it would make you think that they're they're not in trouble at all but that's just one species of crocodile today so things like the the nile crocodile the american alligator as well is um is th these these groups are considered at least concern or least risk in terms of the official status of them so yeah i think i think there's a further so one two three four five six seven eight yeah, there's about 13 crocodile species which are considered least risk or least concern so about half and half, really. Half are in trouble and half are doing doing okay. Okay, and is that linked at all uh, with their ecology, how how they are living and what they are specialised to do? So you you mentioned the gharial. Gharial? Gharial? Um, potato, potato. What is it? Gar gharial? Oh, I, I would say gharial, but, gharial. Uh, but I'm not necessarily a kind of authority on that. Uh, it might be a potato, potato type thing where either is okay. I, I tend to say gharial, but I've heard people say gharial before. Yeah. In the comments, listeners, gharial or gharial, just write down whichever you, you say. So does any of that have to do with their ecologies? So how they are living and the types of adaptations to the environments that they have. So if we think about the Gharial, uh, that is a very specialist, long, super thin snout. Is is that got anything to do with why it's threatened? And what different types of ecologies do modern crocodile morphs have? Are they all doing the same crocodile-y kind of thing? So yeah, I, I guess I'll start with the the latter point first because that's probably the easiest thing to cover. So in in living crocodiles, in, in the 26 living species, you, you see three major morphotypes, I'd say. So three major morphological um, forms. There's what, we, what you'd describe as the broad-snouted alligator-like ones. So that includes things like the alligator, obviously, the American alligator, but it also includes things like uh, the caimans, so um, spectacle caimans and broad-snouted caimans. These things have more U-shaped snouts, which are quite broad. You then have the the, the crocodile-like morphotype, where their 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 snouts are more more elongate and they're kind of more more like a elongated V shape, and that includes most crocodiles, so things like the Nile crocodile. 
And then you also see a very slender snouted form, which is, like you mentioned, very, uh, typified by the Gario, where they have an incredibly long snout, uh, and it, which is very slender. You also see a couple of, of crocodiles which go towards this morphology. So there's, um, the, uh, there's things like the uh, Thomas Stoma, which is um, which has a long snout, um, and that though so within those three different morphologies, there's a clear ecological signal. So particularly in the latter one, in the slender snouted form, those uh, crocodiles are more adapted to eating things like fish and small bodied prey. So you you can't take an entire animal in in your mouth with with this with these slender jaws. They they tend to pick up little little prey, so small fish, maybe small mammals and small uh, reptiles. Within both the, the the crocodile snout and the alligator snout, they tend to eat whatever they want, really. So the, there are subtle differences in the in the function and biomechanics of those different snout morphologies, but they tend to just eat whatever they want. They're, they're large predators, and they tend to eat large prey, uh, typified again by things like a Nile crocodile chomping on wildebeest. So in terms of which of these morphologies is linked to how vulnerable they are or how how well they're doing, I'd say it's a mixed message, really. So in the in the sample of critically endangered crocodiles, you, you find things like the gharial, which is long-snouted, but you also find some of the alligators, so the Chinese alligator, and you also find some of the crocodiles, like the Philippine crocodiles and the Siamese crocodiles. So I don't think there's a clear pattern of of their morphology and their and their species numbers, and also their the abundance of these different animals. What I imagine it's probably more to do with is their their how geographically restricted they are. So, a lot of the um, crocodiles that are in trouble tend to have quite restricted geographic ranges. Uh, things like the Philippine crocodile, the Chinese alligator, Siamese crocodile, Cuban crocodile. They're all kind of linked to a very particular place in a very small geographic range. Whereas a lot of the other groups, like the saltwater crocodile and the Nile crocodile, the ones that aren't in trouble, they cover larger ranges in terms of their geography. So I imagine if there was a link or one 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 thing that was linked to their uh, species abundance, then it's probably that. It might be their their geography rather than their morphology. So there are differences in their ecologies, but if we look at it relative to different groups, uh, for instance, the birds again, which are turning to be a very good uh, group to compare the crocodile moths to, um, are their ecologies particularly diverse? I would say um, no. So yeah, within crocodiles, they do show variation. So gharials eat fish, larger broader snouted crocodiles eat eat whatever they want but they're all what you would say semi-aquatic carnivores so they all exist on shores and uh, in rivers and in wetlands uh, there's only one marine crocodile the, the saltwater crocodile that goes um, in the oceans so in terms of their ecology of their feeding of, and of their habitat occupation they're, they're not particularly diverse today they're very important for ecosystems as, as, as top-tier predators, but when you compare them to other large tetrapod groups, things like mammals, birds, again, like you mentioned, they're, they're really not very diverse in terms of ecology. Like, like if you think of, of birds, you have penguins, ostriches, um, hummingbirds, and within mammals, you have anything from a mouse to a whale. The, the, the amount of morphological variation there and, ecolo- and ecological variation is really huge. Whereas in crocs, so they all exist in these semi-aquatic habitats and they all generally eat fish or other large prey. You don't see any crocs uh, uh, climbing around in the trees. Although funnily enough, there is actually a few YouTube videos of crocodiles that have ended up in trees. But that's what? not... Yeah, I think, I, th- I think I've seen that before. I can't remember what type of crocodile it was, but I've seen a video of a crocodile in a tree before. And that's one of those things where... Animals have niches and have ecologies, but occasionally they do something really, really odd. Um, and you don't see many crocodiles running around on land, but there is there is a species of crocodile that can, can actually gallop quite well. I think it might be the Cuban crocodile. There was a recent study about this. Uh, but again, that kind of galloping around on land is 
is a side a side point to their overall ecology, which is these semi aquatic predators. And again, if you compare it to these other equally ancient groups, then crocodiles don't really do that much today. Hmm. Well. Uh, today, maybe they did something a bit more different in the past. Uh, so let's have a look at some of uh, the crocodilomorphs through time. So if we look to, back to the very first one in the fossil record, uh, what was it like? And was it very different to the modern crocodile, uh, crocodiles, crocodilomorphs that we have today? Yeah, so, yeah, so that's a very important point. I should say as, as well. So throughout this throughout this chat, we we might call them crocodiles, crocodile line reptiles, crocodilomorphs, but the term crocodile in 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 the literature has a very particular meaning. So that that refers only to crocodilia, which is the larger clade that includes all modern animal modern crocodiles and their extinct relatives. But for the sake of us chatting, we can just call all crocodilomorphs crocodiles. It oh, makes okay. it, yeah, that so, makes it easier. Yeah, it's one of those things where um, if you if you wrote it in a scientific paper, you'd get told off. But we we can call them crocodile line reptiles or, or just crocodiles, because uh, m- most most people know what you mean. But yes, yeah, sure. but yeah. So the the earliest crocodiles or crocodile line reptiles uh, are from the Triassic, and and they're very different to what modern crocodiles are like today. So there's a few examples uh, there's a there's a sphenosuchians don't worry so much about about the name of the grouping but that's the the kind of earliest um group of of crocodilomorphs uh, crocodiles including things like hesperosuchus and dromecosuchus so these were around in the late triassic and they were land animals so that's the, that's the main difference uh, they they existed within terrestrial environments and they lived alongside early dinosaurs and they were, they had longer legs, so they 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 have, had more of an upright posture, and they would move around on land as 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 terrestrial predators, and they were generally smaller, so they were maybe only one meter long or one and a half meters long, so they weren't the the large lumbering uh, semi aquatic animals that we see today. The the earliest crocodiles or the earliest crocodile line reptiles were these fast moving terrestrial predators trying to think of a modern analogy they were maybe kind of like a, a dog-like animal um, obviously very different but that type of um, of size and that type of um, movement around on land so yeah sort of like a komodo dragon may, maybe even more maneuverable than a komodo dragon um, because they, they had longer legs so that's what some people use as a as a proxy for how well things could kind of bound around on land how, how long their legs are but yeah, I guess a Komodo dragon, or, or, or um, yeah, or kind of a, a wolf-like posture with, with long legs and long bodies, and they were kind of bound around on, on land. And that sounds yeah, terrifying. Yeah, f- thankfully they were quite small, so um, yeah, maybe sounds the size less of, terrifying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can imagine if they were the size of a of, of, a, of an Nile crocodile, that would be terrifying. One thing we one, one thing we could add as well is that so when we talk about crocodiles. Um, Crocodiles are a type of archosaur, and um, they exist. The earliest crocodiles existed at the time that other crocodile line reptiles were also doing quite well. So, um, crocodiles and crocodilomorphs are a, are a subgroup of the crocodile line reptiles. There were also things, um, their closest relatives, um, which are not crocodiles, um, are things like uh, the rawasukids. So, if anybody watched Walking with Dinosaurs back in the day, the very first episode has something called Postosuchus, which is a large, maybe two meter long terrestrial animal. And that is a bit more like a, a land a land grow, going um big Nile crocodile size thing. So these these smaller terrestrial um crocodiles uh, evolved alongside the, their closest relatives, which were these larger terrestrial animals. Some of them were predatory and some of them were also herbivorous, but all of these other groups went extinct during the Triassic. And the only the only group of crocodile line reptiles that carried on was was the crocodilomorphs or uh, other crocodiles as, as we can shorten that to. 
Okay, and so we have our first uh, crocodile now. Uh, have they changed much through their evolution? And if not, why? And that's a question from Laura Jade on Instagram. So, yeah, so one one thing about crocodiles is that they're sometimes called living fossils, which makes people think that they don't change very much, but that that's not entirely the case. So we talked about the, the earliest crocodiles, so... The earliest crocodiles were these terrestrial um, animals wandering around on land alongside the early dinosaurs in the Triassic. But from that, along the, the it, within the crocodile tree or the crocodilomorph tree, you have these branching events um, leading to very different ecologies. So in the Jurassic, you have the expansion of marine crocodiles or crocodilomorphs. And these marine animals um, invaded the um, oceans and became very diverse. These were known as the Philatosuchians. So these evolved dolphin and whale-like ecologies. They had Some of them had long snouts and they would feed on fish and they would swim around in the oceans, whereas other, others had more robust jaws and skulls and they would eat other, other, other marine reptiles, really. So kind of a, a, whale, a killer whale-like ecology. And that's just one offshoot of the of the uh, crocodile tree. You also had um, other terrestrial crocodilomorphs, so so other land dwelling groups. The most diverse and, and well studied of these is the Notosuchians. So these originated in the Jurassic, but really took off in the Cretaceous. And they, um, uh, my favourite crocodile lion reptile group and crocodilomorph group, but. They were fully terrestrial. They evolved all sorts of diets. So they were herbivorous, omnivorous. Some of them were large um, terrestrial carnivores, so kind of two-meter-long predators running around on land. Um, and they existed uh, from the Cretaceous right through until about, about 30 million years ago. But along these kind of branching events within the crocodile uh, tree, you do have the appearance of some crocodiles that you would say are very crocodile So you, you had the appearance of, of crocodiles which, which are like the modern forms. These first appeared in the Jurassic, so they weren't actually crocodiles. Uh, so it, it's not like you had a Nile crocodile in, in, the, in the Jurassic, but you had animals, you had crocodile, crocodile morphs, uh, which had very similar ecologies. So they were semi-aquatic, two meter long, two or three meter long predators and they had similar skull and jaw shapes uh, so their snout morphologies were similar so when people talk about crocodiles not changing much through time um, it's definitely not the case but what you do find is that you have you have crocodilomorphs from the jurassic which look superficially like the crocodiles that we have today that's why sometimes people say that they are living fossils or they haven't changed very much you actually find the earliest examples of, of the modern crocodile families in the uh, Cretaceous and early Paleogene. So that's from around about 90 million years onwards. You start seeing the earliest examples of things like early alligators and early crocodiles. And then you see, you see early gharials um, about, about 70 million years ago, 60, 70 million years ago. So these modern crocodile families are very ancient uh, but uh, they have changed through time. Even the modern groups uh, have changed uh, through geological time. But what you, I think the, the, the kind of fallacy that they're a living fossil comes from the fact that you've, you've had examples of this, this modern ecology around for a very long time. A question we got from I'm Alice on Instagram is, what is one weird croc that evolution saw fit, but otherwise seems a bit silly? Ah. Uh, that's a great question. Yeah, so this is one of my favourite things about extinct crocodilomorphs, that there are some really, really odd ones. I guess to give one example, uh, there was this um, extinct alligatoroid, so an extinct um, crocodile closely related to modern alligators called uh, Morosuchus, uh, and it had a really broad uh, pancake-shaped snout, so it was kind of like a big duck 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 shaped snout um, people sometimes call it like the pancake croc and then um, it was it was odd because it, it's its snout was very both very long and very broad kind of like a really elongated u-shaped um, and linked to that it, it's its lower jaw was also very slender 
So when you think about that compared to modern crocodiles, it's extremely odd having this this really long snout, which is also very flat, and having the, these gracile, very slender jaws. And this this extinct alligator uh, obviously had a very different ecology. It wasn't able to chomp down on things and, and crush on them. Uh, it was probably more of a, a filter feeder, or, or, or well, maybe not filter feeder, maybe like a, a sieve feeder. So it would maybe accumulate um, particles of maybe mud and, and sand in its mouth and kind of kind of shuffle through the the particles in its mouth and pick out little bits of prey so when you think about that compared to to modern crocodiles it's it's very odd and there's obviously no no crocodiles around today that that have that kind of morphology or that kind of ecology yeah i'm absolutely blown away one by that and two by pretty much everything else that you said before so dolphin crocodiles whale crocodiles like there's just so much going on that you just don't think of when you look at the modern ones um which is your absolute favorite which is a question from dr jj hill on uh, instagram oh uh, nice to hear from jj so um i, th- I think i'll Oh, it's hard to pick because there's so many, so many cool crocodiles, both modern and, and extinct. I think probably my favourite extinct um, crocodile morph would be one called Simosuchus. So this was a a Notosuchian crocodile morph. So one of those those odd terrestrial crocodile morphs from the Cretaceous. This one was actually known from the the very end of the Cretaceous, about about sixty six million years ago. And it was uh, only about one meter long. It was a terrestrial animal uh, with a, a more upright posture, and it was actually a herbivore. So it had a very, um, very short snout, almost like a like a some people describe it as being pug faced. So it had like a very a very small, broad snout, and it had very chunky, robust jaws. And in its jaws, it had these weird, weird teeth which uh, studies have shown uh, were clearly adapted for, for eating plants. So that, that's, that's, again, very odd compared to modern crocodiles. But there's actually some quite nice reconstructions of this animal because it's known from really wonderful fossils. People have been able to make um, nice model reconstructions of what it looked like. And, and then if you search for it, it really is incredible. Or it looks like a mammal, to be honest. It looks almost like, um, yeah, like a... Like a badger type thing but but scaly um and it's got this very 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 um abbreviated snout um and it, it's actually an outlier in, in most analyses that i do on on crocodile evolution it, it's always one of the odd ones out that's probably my favorite fossil crocodile my favorite living crocodile is probably the broad snouted caiman so that's obviously a type of caiman and as the name suggests it has a very broad snout also kind of has like a, a um, quite odd pug-like face. Its its snout is short and broad, and it and its lower jaw is very very robust and heavily built as well. And they look when you when you look at them, they've looked like they've got a lot of character. They look like, look kind of cheeky. So I, I think that's um, a modern crocodile that's also a little bit odd. And um, yeah, it's probably my favourite living crocodile. You mentioned the scales there. Are, have crocodiles always been? scaly what what's their skin like and has it changed in any of those different groups yeah so most most extinct and and modern crocodiles uh, are scaly so that they're, they're scaly and they have um this bony um um armor um sometimes called scoots which cover their body and that's what what gives crocodiles their very robust appearance and they're very very um kind of their yeah they're, they're, it's their armor they um, um, which which helps protect them and makes them so so dangerous. There are actually a few uh, some extinct crocodiles uh, which l- have reduced armor. Um, so the the Philatosuchians, uh, the very specialized ones that became adapted for uh, marine existence and wanted to become more hydrodynamic, actually lost some of their 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 armored scoots, which would um, improve their kind of hydrodynamic uh, efficiency. Um, generate less resistance in the water so it shows how um, they're able to adapt in that way but, yeah but most most land dwelling crocodiles and, and and lake dwelling crocodiles have this have this armor in terms of scoots and, and scales 
So, turning to your study itself, you looked at the fossil record of crocodiles and sought to figure out how they all differed from each other and how and when these differences arose. So, what did the study actually look like, you know, day to day? What what were you doing and what kinds of data did you use? Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall and Liz Martin Silverstone with contributions from Tom Fletcher, Vish Venkat and Elsa Pancharoli. Music was composed by Patrick Kendall Smith. Paleocast was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association. But the show now relies on funding from you, the listeners. So if you've liked this episode, please consider donating and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programs, and follow us across social media platforms to get all the latest news. Finally, if you enjoy our podcast, then please explore all of our video content on YouTube and follow our other projects, the Virtual Natural History Museum and the Paleocast Gaming Network.